In this video, I'm going to be going through how you get full marks in your IGCSE at Excel chemistry exam. Now, for me, doing really well in chemistry and actually getting to grips with this pretty difficult subject, I know lots of my tutees think it's the most difficult of the sciences, a huge part of that is understanding how the periodic table works and how it can actually really benefit you. So the first thing for me would be to say, make sure you make the periodic table your best friend when it comes to doing well in chemistry. Remember that the right hand side is the non-metals, the left hand side is the metals, and therefore what comes with that is specific properties. Remember that metals are good conductors of heat and electricity, and that's due to their free electrons. They tend to be hard, they tend to have high melting points. In comparison, non-metals are non-conductors. The exception here is graphite, which is an allotrope of carbon. They tend to be quite soft, and they tend to have low melting points. Obviously, there are exceptions to these rules. Something like mercury is a metal which is unusual in that it has a low melting point. And then carbon, in the form of graphite and diamond, is extremely hard and has a very high melting point, and that's over here. So these rules don't apply to every single element, but in general they hold true. So now what can we also determine from the periodic table? Well, remember that group 1 metals are known as the alkali metals. This means that when they are added to water, they produce an alkaline solution. So hopefully, therefore, that will help you realise that metals produce basic oxides. They're effectively pHs above 7. And therefore, by definition, because we tend to know that the opposite is true for the non-metals, we can say that they form acidic oxides. And remember, your example is always asking you about this sort of thing. So try and use the fact that group 1 metals are known as alkali metals to help you with that. Now, if you look more closely at the key, it's really important that you understand how this works. The top number, we're told, is the relative atomic mass. The bottom number is the atomic number. Now, the atomic number equals the proton number... And because elements are neutral, it also equals the electron number. Why is that? Well, that's because protons have a charge of plus one, electrons have a charge of minus one. So therefore, we need to have equal numbers of protons and electrons in order for our atom to be neutral. Now, that top number is the mass number, and that's made up of both the proton and neutron number. Why is that? Well, that's because protons have a mass of 1 and neutrons have a mass of 1. Electrons have a tiny mass and therefore are not counted in the mass number. So if we have a look at an example, how about fluorine? What is its atomic number? Well, according to the key, it is 9. What is its mass number? Well, according to the key, that is 19. Now we can start working out extra things. So what about the proton number? Well, I've already said that the atomic number is the same as the proton number, so therefore fluorine's proton number is 9. What is its electron number? Well, because I've said it's the same as the proton number, it's also 9. Lastly, we can work out its neutron number based on the fact that we know its mass number is 19, we know that its proton number is 9. So what must its neutron number be? Well, it must be 19 take 9, so it is 10. So really, really get to grips with what your key is telling you on the periodic table. Let's now look at electronic configurations. Taking the element beryllium, remember only two electrons can go into the first shell, and then after that it's eight electrons. We know that its electron number is four, so therefore its electronic configuration is two, two. How about sodium? Well, it has 11 electrons, so therefore its electronic configuration is two, eight, one. How about lithium now? It only has an electron number of 3, so it's 2, 1. So what can we see from both of these elements which are in the same group? Well, we can see that they both have the same number of electrons in the outer shell. And that actually explains why all elements in the same group have the same chemical properties, because they have the same number of outer shell electrons. Now let's clear some space so we can actually make some more additions. 
So what else have we learned? Well, we've learned that a vertical column in the periodic table is known as a group, and that all elements in the same group have the same number of outer shell electrons. Now, don't forget that the group number is provided. This is group 1, this is group 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 0 or 8. So we know that all the elements in a particular group have the same number of outer shell electrons. So it corresponds with their group number. Group 1, lithium, sodium, potassium, etc. will have one electron in the outer shell. Group 7, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, etc. will have seven electrons in the outer shell. But how about we take a horizontal row now? take this one. Well, a horizontal row is known as a period. And again, they correspond. So here's period one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What is true about elements in the same period? Well, let's work it out. Let's compare sodium's electronic configuration, 281. That's because it has 11 electrons with aluminium's electronic configuration, which is 283. And then with sulfur's electronic configuration, which is 283. Six. What do all these elements have in common? Well, notice that they all have three shells of electrons. So what is true for all elements in the same period? They have the same number of shells of electrons. Next up, we can use the periodic table to help us work out the charges on various ions. Now notice that for the metals, the charge on the ion is the same as the group number, so for sodium it will just be Na1+, magnesium it will be Mg2+, aluminium it will be Al3+. Notice that this chunk of elements is the transition metals. It's going to be much harder for you to remember their charges on the ions because unfortunately you just have to learn those off by heart. The key ones for me to learn would be Zn2+, which is zinc, Ag+, which is silver, Au plus, which is gold. Iron is unusual. It's either Fe3 plus or Fe2 plus, but luckily, when they give you the exam question, it will say something like this. And that Roman numerals inside the bracket will actually tell you the charge on the ion. Copper is also important, which is Cu2 plus. Next up, understanding what the ion charges are on the non metals. Well, quite straightforward. You don't have to learn them, you just need to learn that the charge on the ion is. 8 minus their group number. So for non-metals, the charge on the ion is 8 minus the group number. So for nitrogen, that's in group 5, so 8 minus 5 is 3. So its charge on its ion will be N3 minus. Be very careful, it's minus when it comes to looking at the ion charges for non-metals. Oxygen it's going to be 8 minus 6, so that's O2 minus. Fluorine, 8 minus 1, so that's F minus. Remember that the group 0 elements are monatomic, so they exist as single atoms. Why? Because they are very unreactive. Why? Because they have a full outer shell. Right, you might have wondered why I know that the charges on the metal ions are positive and why I know that the charges on the non-metals are negative, and that's all due to ionic bonding, so I'm actually going to demonstrate that now. So the way in which we prove this is by let's do an ionic bonding diagram for sodium chloride. So we'll start by drawing the electronic configuration for sodium. We know it has 11 electrons. Let's do chlorine now. We know it has 17 electrons. And now what needs to happen now? Well, they both want to become full, so the best thing is for sodium to donate its final electron to chlorine. And so if we redraw both shells, notice that sodium has lost its electron and it has plopped it onto chlorine. So now we need brackets in order to show the charges on the ion. Well, because sodium lost an electron, remember it's negatively charged, it's now positively charged. Because chlorine gained a negative electron, it's now negatively charged. So to actually show you, the charge on the sodium ion is Na+, the charge on the chlorine ion is Cl-. And going back, remember I said that sodium was in group 1, so it would have a 1 plus charge. Chlorine is in group 7, so it will have the Cl minus charge. So hopefully you see that the periodic table is incredibly logical. I now want to touch on which elements are diatomic. You're just going to have to learn that some elements exist as two atoms. So oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, etc. This is going to be important 
when you write chemical equations because otherwise you'll never be able to balance them if you haven't realized that hydrogen is diatomic, for example. Now my friend taught me this mnemonic, horses need oats for clear brown eyes. I know it's weird looking eyes like that, but I'll explain why now. So what elements do these represent? Well, horses is hydrogen, need is nitrogen, oats is oxygen, four is fluorine, clear is chlorine, brown is bromine, eyes is iodine. So as with my biology and physics videos, I would have some last minute notes that I would make that I would look at just before I went into my chemistry exam. Now, what would those notes be? Well, obviously that will depend on you and what you personally struggle with the most. I know I always found the chemical structures topic quite difficult. So I just make myself a brief summary of the four different structures. So there's a giant covalent, giant ionic, giant metallic, and simple molecular. The big thing for me here is knowing what they actually consist of. So what are they made from, which will help me recognize a particular structure when I get given an example. Well, giant covalent, remember, are non-metals only, and you can use your periodic table to help you work out if it's a metal or a non-metal. Giant ionic are a metal and a non-metal, has to be both, remember. Giant metallic, as the name suggests, is metals only. Simple molecular is non-metals. So how are we going to distinguish between whether something is giant covalent or simple molecular? Try and remember the key examples for giant covalent, which is diamond and graphite, and potentially silicon dioxide if they're feeling nasty. You can pretty much assume that everything else is simple molecular, but obviously if you see that the properties are showing that they have a high melting point versus a low melting point, then hopefully you'll understand that that's heading you towards the giant covalent end of things. But giving some key examples of simple molecular, well, carbon dioxide, water, methane, ammonia, these are all examples. What about their melting points now? That's the summary I think that is essential. Well, with giant covalent, it's very high. Same with ionic, same with metallic. Obviously there are exceptions such as mercury, and then crucially with simple molecular, we're looking at low. What about their conductivity? Well, giant covalent does not conduct. The exception here is graphite. Giant ionic doesn't conduct when solid, does when molten or in aqueous solution. Giant metallic obviously being a metal, it will conduct. Simple molecular substances do not conduct. So here's my nice summary, and I might even write that down at the beginning of the exam. I might scribble it on a blank page of my exam paper because it's a good thing to refer to, but only you know if you struggle with this topic or not. Now, in terms of furthering your marks, remember you need key answers and reasons for why they exhibit these various properties. So with giant covalent structure, it's because they have many strong covalent bonds. With simple molecular structures, they have a low melting point because they have weak intermolecular forces. Don't forget that my revision guide is crammed full of these perfect answers and the reasons this is just my last minute notes, which is why I'm not going to write the explanations here. What about mole calculations? Well, a summary here for me would be writing this particular formula triangle, mass MR number of moles. So remember that mass is calculated by doing MR times number of moles. Number of moles is calculated by doing mass divided by MR. There's a second triangle which you can use for titration calculations which states that number of moles is concentration times volume. Concentration is number of moles divided by volume, and volume is number of moles divided by concentration. Remember that that volume must be in decimeters cubed. And if you're given your question in centimeters cubed, you must convert it to decimeters cubed when you do your question. And in order to do that, you have to divide by a 1,000. Now, organic chemistry is often a large part of the paper. Remember, organic chemistry concerns the element carbon. It's so important that you can remember these fundamentals, such as the fact that the simplest hydrocarbons are the alkanes. Learn their general formula, which is CnH2n plus 2. Remember, monkeys eat peanut butter to help you remember the first four members of the alkane family. So that's methane, ethane, propane, and butane. 
in terms of their molecular formula according to this general formula therefore methane would be CH4 ethane's C2H6 propane C3H8 butane is C4H10 what are these various formulas well they are molecular formulae what about if I was asked to provide a structural formulae well we need to show the bonds in this case so here's methane notice that each carbon atom forms four bonds one two three four whereas each hydrogen atom has formed only one bond. What about alkenes now? Well, their general formula is slightly different, CnH2n. What is special about them? Well, it's the fact that they are unsaturated, which means they contain a carbon-carbon double bond. By definition, therefore, methane does not exist. And that's because there aren't enough carbon atoms in methane to make C double bond C. However, we do have ethene, we do have propene, and we do have butene to show you the structural formula of ethene and its molecular formula is C2H4. So I've said that alkenes are unsaturated, that means that alkanes are saturated. The reason why we call them saturated is because they have a carbon-carbon single bond. It's really important that you get to grips with your organic chemistry because it is a large topic and just bear these various things in mind because as always chemistry is full of patterns. So yeah, I do recommend that you make your own last minute notes. I hope you found my bit at the start of the video to do with the periodic table super helpful because by really understanding the principles of chemistry, you can do really well. And I do find that people score the highest in their chemistry exam as long as they've understood everything. The questions are fairly formulaic. There's never anything particularly surprising that comes up. But then the issue with chemistry is that if you don't understand it, it is a bit of a nightmare when it comes to answering the questions, which is why biology can be a bit more straightforward because you can actually use your common sense a little more. But yeah, I'd be interested to know in the comments below which science you think is the easiest, which science is the hardest, and why.